thousand kilometer long fortress between Europe and Asia, the Greater Caucasus. But what lies behind these mountains? A world full of surprises and almost tropical diversity. Rare animals in ancient cultural landscapes. Red hot desert basins in the midst of icy alpine plateaus. Hunters and the hunted. It simmers here beneath the surface. Elemental forces cause mountains to explode and in return, create paradises. In the Lesser Caucasus, between two seas and biblical mountains. It's an age-old question. Where does Europe end? And where does Asia begin? The search for answers leads us to the mountains between Turkey and Iran. A widely unknown highland framed by both the Black and the Caspian Sea, the Lesser Caucasus. In the north, the area borders on a vast mountain range, the Greater Caucasus, where Russia begins. The over 4,000 meter high peaks have been scarcely tapped even to this day. Rugged domes of ice and snow divide countries, habitats and cultures. Even measured by Siberian cold fronts, there is no way through here. As of the East Caucasus, the weather is determined by the Caspian Sea. Freshly fallen snow forces many animals to leave the highlands. The pastures of the East Caucasian ibex remain buried beneath meters of snow. The herd slowly follows the tracks of the elder male. The snow-covered steep slopes pose risks even for the ibex. Their instincts lead them to the southern edges of the mountains, where the wind and the sun melts the snow first. The East Caucasus rises above the clouds like a coast in sky blue. The animals can only forage on its outermost rim. The few open high meadows and stone pits are a magnet for Caucasian snowcocks. Patches like these are essential for them. The hens search for safe nesting sites and eat continually. Very soon, they will lay up to eight eggs. Snowcocks are monogamous. Couples stay together all their lives. He only has to win over his partner once, but a safe breeding place has to be sought after every year. Snowcocks conquer suitable territories acoustically. When the best spots have been taken, a noisy song contest gets underway. The cocks outgun one another in a resounding crescendo that is carried for miles. This is the sound of these mountains. Like the ibex, the snowcocks depend on the few snow-free pastures.
Like a Fata Morgana, the mountains of the Lesser Caucasus appear to hover above the horizon. They are just 150 kilometers as the crow flies away. But they are worlds apart. Three thousand meters below the snowcocks, the land is dusty and hot. A deep basin separates the Caucasian mountains over the entire length. Protected from Siberian cold air, fertile cultural landscapes accrued in Georgia and Azerbaijan. The rivers from the Caucasus are the only water veins in the arid badlands. They are seamed by lush forest pastures, the Tugai. Imperial eagles control the sky above the river valleys. Their eyries thrown on the highest poplars. Imperial eagles hunt anything that they can overpower, birds, reptiles, or small mammals. Even chickens from the nearby villages often land in the eagle's nest. These are then expertly carved beak sized by an adult. Tortoises, on the other hand, are opened like cans and their two shell halves cleanly picked empty. so reminiscent of oases, have been home for herders and wild animals for millennia. Slowly, the water trickles its way down into the basin. The land is becoming continually drier, river valleys turn into gullies. Vultures glide down with the thermal and keep close watch. The open savannas are ideal for their search flights. Three species of vulture live here and they all meet regularly whenever there is something worthwhile meeting for. Vultures observe each other from great distances. When one of them changes his flight pattern, the neighbors react immediately. This is why it often looks as though dozens of the huge birds meet out of the blue. In this case, though, the ground forces arrive before the rest. If vultures have brilliant eyesight, golden jackals have a very fine nose. They know that time is short. 
Although until now there are no vultures in sight, it won't be long before they take over the feeding ground. Until then, the work must be done. The ubiquitous magpies attempt to distract, but the pack has divided into groups. Egyptian vultures don't represent an obstacle either. Smaller than geese, the little omnivores have to be wary when in the vicinity of jackals. The first griffin vulture. The magpies can't stop him. Things are getting tight. The Cinereus vulture is roughly five times the weight of his little relative. Very soon now, it will be teeming with them. It's high time for action. The jackals proceed skillfully. Two of them cause a veritable riot amongst the invading vultures. During the turmoil, the third manages to grab a piece of meat. And none too soon, as now the vultures take over. The lesser the food, the more irritable the mood. Cinereus vultures dance around the carcass. None of the birds managed to swallow a few morsels undisturbed. Time and again, a fresh onslaught. The huge birds attack like kickboxers. Everything seems to be allowed. The winner eventually waddles off proudly, but even he had to fight more than he actually ate. Fresh supplies are not far behind. Without the farmers with their herds, there would not be half as many vultures in the basin between the greater and lesser Caucasus. Not very far away, large swarms of birds graze. Little bastards have escaped the cold of the Russian and Kazakh steppes. The semi-deserts around the Lesser Caucasus are the largest wintering areas of the small bastards. Every year, more than 100,000 of them make their way through the Transcaucasian Basin. A wonder of bird migration at the lowest point between the two mountain ranges. Nine hundred years ago, the world collapsed at the highest ridge of the Lesser Caucasus. An immense earthquake caused the top of Mount Kapas to burst. Probably within seconds, millions of cubic meters of rocks created a completely new landscape. Entire valleys simply disappeared. Rivers were blocked, forests flooded, 
and lakes dammed. Ever since then, this land on the border to Nagorno-Karabakh has remained untouched. A cascade of crystal clear lakes, connected via mountain streams that have found their way through the scree. The landscape is several centuries old as we see it, which, geologically, is hardly more than a few seconds. Born of a catastrophe that could repeat itself tomorrow here in the Lesser Caucasus. Volcanic activity and earthquakes created this highland. Beneath the mountains, the Arabian Peninsula edges its way inexorably towards Eurasia. In the highland further west, the Christian Islamic religious border transects the Lesser Caucasus. In the shadow of the twin peaks of Mount Ararat lies Armenia, a barren land and ancient cradle of Christianity. In winter, temperatures often sink below minus 20 degrees. Pizawa goats are the wild ancestors of all domestic goats. Today, more and more, they're being displaced by their domesticated relatives up into the inaccessible highlands. Only in winter, the animals search for protection in the lower latitudes. Despite scarce settlements, Armenia's mountains are also cultural landscapes and ancient pastures. Herds have roamed across the barren plateaus for more than two millennia. Ancient churches hidden in valleys, many of them over a thousand years old. The Noravank Monastery existed long before the Mongolians made their way to Europe. The Armenians were able to save their modest, yet strong form of Christian belief, despite all foreign domination. No one, not the Romans, Persians or Turks, managed to change that. In the course of centuries of cultural distress, social cohesion in the tiny country only grew stronger. The mountain range breathes history in its every corner. The petroglyphs of Uktazar are more than 4,000 years old. Artists in the Bronze Age scratched them into the volcanic basalt, and these have been extended over the centuries. Pezoa goats, warriors, or leopards are frequent motives in the archaic open-air gallery, with its more than 1,000 works of art. On the next slope, it is as if the drawings have come alive. The Bizawa goats have moved down to snow-free latitudes. In the autumn, the otherwise solitary billy goats follow the larger herds. The obvious reason for their interest? It's the mating season, and you don't leave the ladies waiting. The senior male reviews the situation for hours. When he finds what he's looking for, he purses his upper lip in order to amplify the effect of the female pheromones. 
the hunt is on. Strangely enough, the males work together. Young and old can be found in the herds of the females, and it can get pretty wild. This can be very dangerous in terrain like this. As the hunt grows wilder, both sexes work up a sweat. This strenuous back and forth goes on for days. Many fall and injuries are common. After several days, many of the males are on the brink of collapse. No one knows why bezoa goats need such strenuous foreplay. Is this how the females test their potential partner's fitness? Not everyone is convinced of the results. But so close to home, he won't take no for an answer. The Tita Tit on the rocks runs its course. After around two weeks, the male and female bezoar goats go their own ways for another year. Four and 5,000 metres high, the twin peaks of the Ararats mark the westernmost end of the Lesser Caucasus, the border to Anatolia. Jungle cats spend the entire year here in the reed beds of fish ponds. Though being carnivores, they, like all cats, often eat plants. They are hunters. Jungle cats stalk their prey on the shores in the bright light of day. They're not picky either. The cat is young and curious. As if taken for granted, she follows the tortoise along the pond. She cannot dive away in the shallow water. The attack shouldn't be taken seriously. The cat has eaten enough, and now the youngster just wants to play. The sibling is more focused. The ponds are regularly drained and then fished dry. Whoever remains in the shallow water quickly becomes an easy meal. The cats just have to wait until the catfish swims close enough to the shore. They are in their element. Jungle cats are by nature not scared of water. Fishing has never been so easy for the cats, and they don't have to waste their time strenuously hunting birds in the reeds. Once heaved on land, it's all over for the already weakened catfish. Mm. 
surrounded by cultural land, the fish ponds at the foothills of Mount Ararat provide ample space for wild animals. Despite having ostensibly superior neighbors, small Armenia has been able to retain its independence for millennia. Its barren highland is the heart of the Lesser Caucasus. The steppes in the eastern foreland of Nagorno-Karabakh are the home of nomadic herders. Many families have Persian roots. Iran is just a few kilometers away. <laughs> Hundreds of blue-cheeked bee-eaters swarm over well-trodden livestock paths. The birds set up their colony directly in the backyard of a small farmer family. Neither watchdogs nor other animals detain the vivid flock. It is as if the birds belong there. The reasons for this neighborhood are simple. The bee-eaters breed underground. The more open the soil, the easier it is to build nesting burrows. It's astonishing how the bee-eaters manage to excavate the sometimes meter-deep tunnels with their short feet. The most difficult is the network of roots directly below the surface. This is why someone always keeps a lookout for suitable building shells. An innocent expression. But the owner smells a rat and doesn't hesitate for long. Blue-cheeked bee-eaters exclusively hunt flying insects like dragonflies, wasps or robber flies. Their colonies can often be found near to steppe lakes or irrigation channels. Cables are gladly misused as vantage points. Food is so abundant that the bee-eaters can choose their nesting sites practically anywhere. But if you breed on the ground, you have to reckon with tenants. Desert ants specialize in leftovers. They are like an ant version of a vulture. Their orientation is driven by smell. They approach against the wind direction, enabling them to smell dead insects en route. But the grasshopper is not up for grabs yet. The giant centipede knows exactly what the ant is after. After a while, he gives up and grants the irritating guest his will. Tropical bee-eaters populate the farm like domestic fowl, a colorful side-by-side that can only occur where humans grant wild animals refuge. Golden jackals keep their distance. You don't mess around with Caucasian shepherd dogs. The small pack is on its way back to its hideaway in the irrigation ditch. They sleep off the heat of the day in the reeds. But young jackals are not keen on going to bed early. Just one more game.
The two smallest play around as if they hadn't spent the entire night on the hunt. While another one hunts mosquitoes. And the fourth tries to bring reed stalks to life. Tired parents gracefully accept their fate. The first rays of sun present an astonishing sight. Whose reflection is that? Can it leap on me? Even the waves seem somehow different today. The sun's rising. Time for bed. The canal is connected to a large steppe lake, the Akgur. It's a relic of the once broad marshlands of the Kura and Arax rivers. The two main water veins of the Lesser Caucasus wash their annual high water into an extensive plain and created a unique water wilderness. As a breeding and resting place for hundreds of bird species, the Akgul is of inestimable value. All of Europe's nine heron species, as well as the glossy ibis, nest here in the shallow lake. The abundance of fish in the lake is immense. But good balance is necessary, as reed stalks are not the very best seats. For pygmy cormorants with their webbings, a real challenge. Their advantage is in water. The feet of the herons are not designed for landings in the reeds either. The spoonbill prefers to remain in water while others try to get hold of the redemptive reed stalks above him. Each in his own way. Rarely graceful. It gets quite sporty when ravenous young herons begin to shake the reed stalks. The defense of the squacko heron demands the greatest precision. On the faltering stalks, pecking can be quite dangerous. Just two of the little egrets is feeding who is something only known to the parties concerned. Things are even rougher at the neighbors. It almost borders on acrobatics, how the older birds manage to balance on one square centimeter of reed stalk. As so often happens at a rodeo, the ride ends abruptly. Peace returns with the evening. reed lakes in the old marshes of the Kura and Arax rivers form the most important bird sanctuary in the entire Lesser Caucasus. Every year, the abundance of fish secures the survival of thousands of breeding and migratory birds in the dry cultural landscapes of South Azerbaijan.
In the Georgian foreland of the Greater Caucasus, two tributaries of the Kura have created a spectacular landscape, the canyons of Vashlovani. Calm prevails in the depths of the canyon. The short-toed snake eagle endures the heat, although it's reminiscent of an oven. Should a breeze occur, he wants to store as much cool air as possible. For hours on end, the little eagle observes the flying silhouettes over the canyon. He is, as it is common for snake eagles, the only youngster in the nest. Like a Fata Morgana, an old bird sails aimlessly in the heat haze of the cliffs. But he doesn't land. The other parent is the one that brings the desired prey. And like all birds of prey, young snake eagles are altricial birds. Until they're ready to fly, they have no chance of getting something to drink. It's hardly worth waiting for rain in this desert ambience. Therefore, for the young eagle, every snake is doubly vital. They not only mean food, but also water. This means when he eats a lot, he quenches his thirst at the same time. Like all vertebrates, snakes consist of about two-thirds of water. It is crucial, though, to keep the liquid from the food in the body. The variety of habitats in the Lesser Caucasus region never fails to fascinate. The canyons of Vashlavani are one of these natural wonders. Despite their aridness, they still belong to the most diverse regions stretched out between the Greater and Lesser Caucasus. Towards the east, the canyons gradually become dry steps. They lead down into the basin of the Caspian Sea, whose coast lies 28 meters below sea level. A world as if it were on another planet. Nowhere else are there so many mud volcanoes as in the Caspian lowlands of Azerbaijan. Funnels are cold volcanoes. From the Earth's crust, clay minerals and methane forge their way to the surface. Where there are mud volcanoes, there is often oil. Huge supplies lie dormant beneath the crust of Azerbaijan and the bottom of the sea. Two centuries ago, the people already knew of never-ending dwindling oil wells, from which the fuel could be collected in buckets. In the meantime, most of the oil is produced offshore, but the old pumps on land also never stand still. Day and night, for decades. The Shirvan National Park has the flair of an African savanna. A small group of goited gazelles is jostling in the chill of the morning. The 
the Shirvan semi-desert, is the last important refuge for these gazelles in the Transcaucasus. The animals were widespread in the surrounding lowlands up until the middle of the last century. Excessive agriculture and poaching have decreased the population. Pristine desert steppes, such as in Shirvan, are very rare. Thanks to strict protection, around 2,500 of these animals inhabit Azerbaijan. Goitered gazelles live exclusively in deserts and semi-deserts and are therefore well adjusted to the scarcity of water. The only water they get is in their food. Difficult to imagine when one observes their range of forage plants. In the coastal basin of the Caspian Sea, the gazelles often graze on dry watering places and salt meadows. Many plants have adapted to the soil in the coastal area by either tolerating surplus salt or discarding it. In summer, Greek tortoises are only active in the early morning hours or evenings, for good reason. Despite being reptiles, too high temperatures are more dangerous than the cold. The bodies of the little animals heat up quickly and can overheat if she cannot find shadow somewhere. The male tortoise is overheated in an absolutely different way. The Greek tortoise is notorious for its enthusiasm in flirting. Gruff shoving and knocking is typical of the species and is designed to put hesitant females in the right mood. Once a female has been detected, no time is lost. Should, however, the chosen one face uphill, then the whole thing remains a dry run. That's better. It's much easier downhill. The cold blood becomes a firebrand. The somersault has less to do with lovemaking. If the mating was successful, soon she will lay her eggs in this dune wall. The water level of the Caspian Sea rises and sinks in irregular cycles. Land appears or disappears again in broad lagoons and salt marshes. For Caspian gulls, the areas are ideal breeding grounds. When the water recedes, legacies of the residents become visible. This obviously doesn't trouble the gulls. On the contrary, branches are rare on the non-vegetated areas. Without further ado, the new materials are integrated in the nest building. When combined with natural raw materials, this makes for denser and warmer nests, thus making a virtue out of a necessity. In the heat of the day, two goitered gazelles head for the sea. The animals are neither looking for pasture, nor are they escaping from the irritating horseflies. The water-saving kings drink. They drink in the churned-up sea. Mm. 
more and more animals wade through the lagoon toward the open sea. Is it all of the salt-tolerant plants in the Shirvan that make the desert animals thirsty? The gazelles don't feel very safe at all in the water. When one jumps up, the rest runs off without knowing why. The flight reflex can save lives. This time, the panic was unfounded. The wild boars are not interested in the gazelles. They are combing through the reeds in search of something edible and chew here and there on young reed straws. They spend the whole year in the reeds of the Caspian Basin. A flock of greater flamingos flies across the alpine backdrop of the Lesser Caucasus. Flamingos often fly long haul, always in search of plankton-rich, shallow water. Where has this troop come from? Africa? Central Asia? It's hard to say. The Caspian lagoons are an ideal resting place. The flamingos will filter through the bay for a few days and then fly off again. Mid-days, when it gets too hot, the wild boars set themselves up on the beach. There, they have everything they need and don't have to worry about attacks, neither from farmers nor from bothersome horseflies. The gazelles return to the sea. It remains a mystery why they do that and how they tolerate litres of salt water Behind the world's largest Indian sea lies Iran. The Absheron Peninsula is the last extension of the Caucasus, but here, after more than a thousand kilometers, so to speak, sinks into the Caspian Sea.